Welcome back, Bio 3D Prep. We are going to start our last unit. Uh, it consists of two systems, the excretory system and the muscular system. In this lecture, we're going to look at the excretory system. In your textbook, it's pages two or 304 to 310. And in this lecture, we'll be looking at the anatomy and function of the excretory system. By the end of this lecture, you'll be able to identify the structures of the excretory system. You will be able to describe the function of each part of the excretory system. And here we go. So, for the importance of the kidneys, we know the lungs remove CO2 in respiration, so that gets rid of one waste product. The large intestine removes toxic waste from the digestive system, all that stuff that our body can't digest, that can't enter our cir circulation, is removed that way. The liver is involved in making chemicals less harmful, so they deal with things like alcohol and ammonia, uh, so that their concentrations don't get too high in our blood. But once things are in our blood, they have to have some way out. Toxic chemicals are going into our blood all the time. Uh, for example, carbon dioxide, if we didn't have a way of getting rid of carbon dioxide, uh, our blood would become too acidic and, and we'd die. So the CO2 is removed when we exhale from our lungs. The kidneys are going to be responsible for removing the rest of our waste, they're also going to play a major role in maintaining our blood pH and maintaining our water balance or hydration. So waste, uh, for a definition, it's any substance that is in excess of the body's needs. So it can include things like sodium ions, chloride ions, water, carbon dioxide, all of those things we need, but if their concentrations get too high, it can be bad for our, our body. Some wastes are more dangerous than others. Uh, many of the nitrogen containing compounds are extremely toxic. Uh, amino acids uh, and nucleic acids contain amide groups, groups that contain NH2. Uh, sometimes these two compounds are broken down uh, and converted into carbohydrates in the liver. So if our carbo, especially if we're on those, those low carb diets, um, once all the carbohydrates are gone from our body and the fats start getting used up, the next place our body is going to turn for energy are amino acids or proteins. And so as those amino acids get broken down, uh, amide groups are released and turned into ammonia. So deamination is the process by where uh, amino groups are removed from organic compounds, so that's how we get turn them into carbohydrates. One of the products of deamination is ammonia, which is extremely toxic. Five mi micrograms can kill you. And so that's about that's a millionth of a gram. Five millionths of a gram in your blood can kill you. Uh, so when this happens, your liver deals with the ammonia quite quickly. It reacts it with carbon dioxide, forming urea. And urea is much less, less toxic. Uh, up to your blood can dissolve 1.65 grams of urea and urea is a thousand times less toxic than ammonia, so our blood can handle more urea than ammonia, uh, and it's much, much less toxic. Uric acid is a, another um, ammonia-containing molecule, and again, it's broken down, or it can be used to produce carbohydrates. Uh, by deamination, it produces a similar uh, compound. Uh, uric acid is basically the, the, the product that's made from nucleic acids when they're turned into carbohydrates. So our excretory system, here's a picture of our excretory system, a frontal view of the uh, abdomen. Uh, note here we have the inferior vena cava coming down, and in this picture it's been removed, but the aorta, which is this blood vessel right here, the descending aorta, uh, one branch of it also goes into our each of our kidneys. So we have two kidneys, uh, the aorta was removed from this picture just so you could see uh, the vein, but there's a there's a, an, a renal artery that goes into each of the uh, kidneys as well. So the inferior vena cava, uh, the renal vein, and there's one on this side here, and a longer one shown here. Uh, the renal vein carries blood back to the vena cava, and the the extra the proper excretory system uh, consists of the kidneys the ureter, and the bladder. And the purpose of the excretory system is to separate waste from body fluid, and the removal of the waste from the body. Uh, four major parts, uh, the kidneys, the ureters, the urinary bladder, and the urethra. 
Note the waste is removed with the kidneys. The ureters collect the waste and carry it to the bladder and the urethra empties the waste from the body. So in this picture uh, we can't see the urethra. It would actually be uh, behind the pelvis here. Here's pelvic bones. There's one pelvic bone there, one pelvic bone there. Uh, behind it going down would be the, the rest of the bladder and the urethra. Uh, it's also known as the urinary system because this is where we pee from. The wastes are filtered from the blood by the kidney and sent to the urinary bladder through the ureters. The bladder has a sphincter muscle uh, that acts as a valve allowing for storage of urine. So our blood is continuously being cleaned and urine is continuously being produced but we store it in the bladder for some time. If we didn't we'd be peeing all the time. As the bladder fills it expands and stretch receptors send a message to our brain telling us that hey it's time to go pee, it's time to urinate. Uh, if the bladder accumulates more than about 600 milliliters of urine, voluntary control is lost and we will end up urinating regardless. It's either that or having your bladder explode, which is not a good thing because then all that urine uh, spreads throughout your uh, thoracic or not thoracic cavity, your abdo abdominal cavity, and it's full of waste material. Not a good thing to be spreading around your body. Uh, the male and female urethras are a little bit different. The male urethra is longer. Uh, then the female urethra, female urethra because it has to travel through the penis. So the urethra is part of the excretory system and the reproductive system in males. You'll talk about or learn about the reproductive system in Bio 30. Uh, in females, the systems are complete, completely separate. Here we have a sagittal view of uh, the female excretory system. Here we can see the kidney. Uh, it's not highlighted because it's, well it is highlighted, there it is there. So you can kind of see it starts here. Here's one of the ureters as it comes down to the bladder. The bladder is going to store the waste. Here's the female urethra. Uh, the exit for the female urethra is actually just above the vagina. So here's the reproductive system. Uh, you have the vagina, you have the cervix, and then a uterus and fallopian tubes and all that other fun stuff. Uh, but they are separate systems, whereas in the male system, uh, the urethra carries both semen from the reproductive system and urine from our expiratory system. Now when we look at the kidney, this is where the waste gets removed. Um, on a macroscopic level, on a big level, it looks pretty pretty, uh, pretty simple. It can, can actually contain up to one quarter of the body's blood at any one time. And if you think about these organs, they're just two fist-sized lumps. The fact they can, that they can contain up to one quarter of our blood volume is pretty impressive. Uh, there's three visible structures, the cortex and the medulla, and the cortex is the outer portion. If we just take a look here, the cortex is the darker region, and it would be on the outside of this line that I'm drawing. The medulla would be inside of that, and it's usually a lighter color. The renal pelvis, uh, and here's a good picture of the renal pelvis in this picture here, in picture B. Uh, this is where urine is going to, after urine's form, it's going to be collected and drains down the ureters. So this area here is where the urine's collected from the rest of the kidney. And it turns out that if you take a look at this macroscopic picture, you can't really see much. But if you go, and here we have a, a box drawn on one part of the kidney, if we take that down, and here's the blow up of the picture, where we got again cortex and medulla, on the microscopic level are all of these tubes and there's millions of them throughout the entire kidney. They're called nephrons and they are the functional unit of the kidney. Uh, they join up into collecting ducts and the collecting ducts actually go and form the renal pelvis. So more blood enters the kidney through the renal artery than exits through the renal vein. Or what that means is there's more volume going into your kidney than coming back out which means something's being taken away or it has to, some of it has to go somewhere else. The rest of it is uh, being sent through the renal pelvis and down the ureter to the bladder or some of that blood volume is, is leaving as a waste through the ureter. In diagram C, and this is the one I kind of talked about already, this is how blood is cleansed by millions and millions of microscopic nephrons the collecting ducts merge at the end of each nephron to form the renal pelvis. Uh, so 
now that we've taken a look at the kidney, uh, we're going to spend most of our time talking about this nephron thing, because this nephron is what's doing all the work when it comes to cleaning our blood. If we take a look at the blood, we have the renal artery. This is coming from the uh, descending. aorta. So the aorta comes out of the heart, part of it goes up to our head and our arms, uh, another branch comes down and part of it, it goes to our legs, but two major two major branches head out towards our kidney so that blood so that waste can be removed from our blood. So the renal artery goes into the kidney, it forms the incoming arterial. And here we can see in the picture the incoming or the renal artery and this here is the incoming arterial. Sorry for squishing the words in there. So the incoming arterial blood is going to travel from that into the glomerulus, which is this structure here. And it looks like a capillary bed, in a, in a way it kind of is, but notice that in most capillary beds in the body, uh, we lose oxygen from the capillary bed. So the arteries going into the capillary bed are carrying red blood or oxygenated blood, and the blood normally coming out of a capillary bed is deoxygenated, at the glomerulus, this is not the case, because notice that the blood coming out of it is still red. So we still have oxygenated blood, and this is going to be the outgoing arterial. So this is incoming and then outgoing. From this outgoing arterial, notice that it comes back around our nephron again. So this, this beige tube is our nephron, and then a web, a capillary web, kind of covers that entire structure. And here is where oxygenation of the tissues occurs. Oxygen leaves the blood, leaves the capillaries, goes to all the cells around the nephron and in the kidney, and then deoxygenated blood is carried away. So we have our outgoing artillery, arterial to our capillary network, to the renal vedule, to the renal vein. So this uh, would be the renal venule, remember a venule is just a small vein, so there's a renal venule, and so blood's going to go back out, and then up to the heart, out to the lungs to get some oxygen, back to the heart, and back out to the rest of the body. But this is the path of the blood. Now, if we see the arrangement of blood vessels associated with the nephrons unique, there's actually two capillary beds in sequence. The first capillary bed has nothing to do with deoxygenation, so the question is, what the heck is it there for? The second capillary bed there's deoxygenation, so that's kind of normal. But again, why is it wrapping around all those tubes? So here's what's happening. This is where blood is going to get cleaned. Uh, the first thing that's going to happen is filtration. Everything's going to get filtered out of the blood. So the afferent arterial, or the incoming arterial, afferent, incoming, same thing. Uh, I like the word afferent because it sounds nice. It branches from the renal artery and enters a structure called the glomerulus. And here, we saw it on the last page as well, but this and the glomerulus, here's where we've got to watch our terms, is the capillary bed. This is the glomerulus. It's surrounded by a structure called Bowman's capsule. Oops, Bowman's capsule. And so blood pressure gets so high inside of that glomerulus that a bunch of water and ions, or basically the plasma portion of your blood, gets forced out of the glomerulus into Bowman's capsule and enters the nephron. And that's the filtration. It's almost like a coffee filter. Um, if you put, when you put coffee in your coffee machine, you pour water over top, the force of that water pulls a bunch of the coffee into or through the filter. The grounds still stay in the filter because they're too big to pass through, but a bunch of the coffee flavor, the caffeine, all the good stuff comes through the filter and into the pot. Same idea here. Water, ions, glucose, urea are all forced out. These form the filtrate. So the filtrate is a thing that's entering Bowman's capsule. Now the large molecules such as blood proteins, uh, fibrinogen, globulins, all those blood proteins blood proteins we talked about in the circulatory system, they all stay in the blood. They pass out through the efferent arterial or the outgoing arterial. 
so do all of the blood cells. All of the blood cells stay inside of our circulatory system. They're too big to fit through the glomerulus. The capillary reef, the capillary branches reform. So at our glomerulus, here we have another arterial coming back out, and this is the outgoing or efferent arterial. Now, all of that good stuff, all of the glucose, all of our ions, a lot of the water all just left our circulatory system. That's not a good thing. We need most of those things. The only thing we really wanted to get rid of was the waste. So most of it has to get reabsorbed back into our circulatory system. And this happens in the structure called the tubule. And this picture here, here's the beginning of a tubule. This is the proximal tubule. Proximal because it's close to the glomerulus. So proximal tubule. Notice that if we just kind of follow it, this is like one of those uh, game books where you got to follow the tube to see where it goes. And if we follow it around and around, it comes down under here. Look at that. I can't even tell where it's all going. Here we go. It comes down, and eventually it comes down along here. It gets narrow. And here is the loop. And it loops around. It's called the loop of... Henel. It comes down, oops, my four-year-old can do a better job filling this in. All right, there we go. Comes down, comes back up. Once we come back up and we get wide again, this is called the distal tubule. So in this tubule, and if we follow this, it comes all the way back up, wraps around, and even ends up coming back down into here. So all of this tubule here, if we follow it around, this is all distal tubule. It's all after the loop of Hanel. So it's far away from the glomerulus in terms of structure. So distal tubule, notice it all wrapped around and it's tangled up. Most of this tubule is where reabsorption is going to happen. All of the good things we wanted, all the good things that entered our, our nephron are going to end up back in our blood. Some of the waste is also reabsorbed, so it's going to be returned to the, to the nephron via a process called secretion. After the distal tubule is a collecting duct, which is this structure uh, at the very end of the tubule. Notice it has a bunch of branches on it. This is a collecting duct. Uh, on our side picture here, notice that there are several nephrons, each feeding one collecting duct. So one collecting duct as attached to several nephrons and collecting all of the urine that's being produced. And those collecting ducts go when they make our renal pelvis. So the tubules wind into a large pipe called the collecting duct. The fluid inside the duct is now called urine. The collecting ducts form uh, by multiple distal tubules. And the collecting ducts then merge to form the renal pelvis. And that's the, the summary of uh, our excretory system. In the next lecture, we're going to be looking specifically at what is reabsorption, how do materials end up going from our uh, nephron into our circulatory system, how does the waste get back into our nephron, and all that fun stuff. So, uh, in summary, here's what we should get from this lecture. Urine is waste collected from the blood by a pair of kidneys in our body. It's formed by nephrons through three major processes they're known as filtration, reabsorption, and secretion, though each of those words has a specific meaning. Urine passes from the kidney to the ureters through the renal pelvis and is stored in the bladder until our bladder is full. Uh, then it's released through the urethra, through, through the urethra to the environment. Uh, the waste-filled blood is brought to the kidney by the renal artery, and then once it's cleaned, it's returned to our body, uh, returned to the vena cava where it can then enter the rest of our body. So from the renal vein to the venal ca vena cava. Again, in the next lecture, we're going to look at specifically how is this waste removed from our body.